Um, so uh, photojournalism is our um, is uh, is a topic of conversation today. Um, I'm going to start by um, I'm going to start by losing track of all my different little things here. Um, let me share my screen and we'll go to a PowerPoint I prepared. I want to start with this one of my all-time favorites, as a matter of fact. Um, I suppose I should know the date, but it was 1937 in Lakehurst, New Jersey, as many of you know. 22 photographers were on site to, to get this one, um, probably the definition of news photography, which is slightly different than photojournalism, not to parse words, uh, but I'm gonna start by parsing words anyway. Um, how is photojournalism different than other stuff? So it, that's, that's my way of, um, uh, asking and answering what is photojournalism is to say uh, the, 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 the ways by which it differs from other kinds of photography, uh, the other kinds of photography that it resembles, which is mostly documentary photography and street photography. How does it differ from them? Why isn't it them? Why aren't they it? Um, and I would say in a nutshell, uh, photojournalism uh, although it surely resembles documentary photography, and, and we'll talk about those resemblances in a minute, um, although it surely uh, resembles documentary photography, the important difference is that um, uh, photojournalists um, have a mission uh, which is often imposed on them from the outside. In other words, they are not simply photographers, nor are they simply artists, nor are they simply flaneurs, um, uh, moseying down a busy city street, uh, drinking in the cavalcade of life. They have a mission, and uh, at least part of that mission is that they have a job. Um, they represent a much larger organization, uh, that is their newspaper or their magazine. They've been given an assignment, it's a, it's a, a mandate that they need to acquit uh, in a certain uh, visual style that is um, familiar to the readers of, of that organ. Um, and they have certain ethics, and they have certain conventions, and they have certain kind of clerical tasks that they need to, to do while they make pictures. They need to, for example, get caption information and the identification uh, of people. They need to spell things right. Um, and besides that, there's kind of the, um, uh, the, the spirit uh, nature of the, um, uh, of that behavior, which is in the spirit of fair play, in the spirit of transparency, in the spirit of accuracy. Um, they are trying to get stuff right. Uh, they are trying to um, have good humor with their uh, fellow travelers. And so there's a lot of stuff on the photojournalist. The photojournalist signs up for a lot more than the street photographer does the documentary photographer does, the portrait photographer does. Um, this is not a value um, equation. Uh, it is not better or worse, good or bad. Uh, it's, it's neutral in that moral sense, but it does separate the photojournalist from those others. Uh, what does it say here? A photojournalist is a documentary on deadline behaving uh, by certain rules of fair play, meeting certain professional conditions, speaking in a direct visual language that everyday readers can understand. As Janice told you, I myself was a photojournalist for many years and I was at my least comfortable when um, I wanted to make photographs in a, a visual language uh, that was not particularly direct. Um, in other words, I had an artsy urge to uh, deconstruct the given narrative of an event, which is pretty interesting and cool. Gary Winogrand did it all the time. And in my personal work, I have continued to do that. Uh, however, as a photojournalist, that's deadly. It's exactly the opposite of what a photojournalist is called upon to do. Um, so you can't make pictures where we don't know what's going on. 
uh, one is obligated to speak directly in a visual sense and uh, in whatever other sense. Um, uh, your job is to communicate something in a visual language that people are familiar with. Um, and often that leads to um, the cliches that we see, frankly, in, in so much daily photojournalism. Um, those are folks who are confronted with this very issue uh, and, and they don't exercise enough imagination or are simply constrained by, um, by uh, uh, the constraints of, of deadlines and um, locations and uh, the willingness of, of subjects to um, uh, participate. So, um, you know, uh, uh, one needs to speak in direct language. Uh, it's hard to do, it's hard enough to do as it is. Um, anyway, photojournalists uh, serve a known audience. We know who our audience is. Um, other photographers uh, simply roaming the planet don't necessarily know who their audience is. Uh, some of them who have uh, contracts or relationships at galleries have a feeling for the audience that that gallerist has gathered around her. If you have different galleries, you might have a feeling for the different kinds of, of uh, clientele that each of your gallerists has gathered around him or her. Uh, if you work for a magazine or a nonprofit, if you work for the government, you are aware of different audiences. These are the people uh, at whom you are uh, pointing your communication. Uh, and and that, uh, that knowledge uh, uh, um, influences the way you go about doing your work. Uh, photojournalists have a known audience, and that is your standard and general reader of this newspaper or this magazine, um, uh, whatever. And so we know where we're pointing our communications, unlike many other photographers who aren't sure yet where they're pointing, uh, or and many of them will never know uh, to whom they are uh, addressing their pictures, but a photojournalist does know that. Photojournalists typically accept the conditions, restraints, and obligations of such service. Uh, you have to write captions uh, and meet deadlines. You have to get your pictures back to the office. Uh, if the situation heats up, you can't dally. You got to shoot and run. Uh, there are a variety of, of such constraints and conditions placed on a photojournalist. We'll talk in a little while about Robert Kappa, but one of the famous stories about Robert Kappa, the great legendary uh, a, a war photographer, uh, who may have been a bit of a sham, um, was that on D-Day itself, an event for which he had been preparing for months, uh, he had only a half hour to shoot. He got onto to, uh, Normandy Beach, uh, shot for a half hour, had to get back to the landing craft, uh, back to England, back to London, back to the uh, Life Magazine Bureau in London, get a half hour to shoot. Uh, and no matter what happens, he can't dither or dally. He's got to go back into the waves, back onto the landing craft and get out of there, uh, back to London. So that's the kinds of conditions under which photojournalists work. They are part of a machine. Um, and uh, it behooves them to know and accept that. Okay, another of my favorite Hindenburg pictures. Um, we're gonna switch gears now. Uh, that was a kind of anti-definition of what photojournalism is by telling you what it is not. In other words, it is not, um, it is not something that one plays at. As a photographer, I love playing at my pictures. My personal uh, uh, work uh, tends to be playing at pictures and seeing what emerges, but a photojournalist has got a job to do. And that changes everything. That changes attitude, that changes workflow, that changes the work method. Um, one has to uh, be more confident, less unsure. One has to explore less and express more. One has to move forward, forward, forward and get back on the landing craft. Um, sorry to say, those are the conditions under which photojournalists work, and that's who photojournalists are. Um, but now we're going to switch. We're, it, well, we're not going to switch. We're going to say done with that. 
full stop on that. Let's move into uh, a, a version of photo history. Um, FYI, I will jump in and out of various eras in order to make various points that I believe are worth making. So this won't be all linear. It'll be back and forth and kind of uh, lateral in it. So we're gonna duck walk our way through this history. Um, the history of photojournalism, like most other histories, is shaped by a confluence of innovations, trends, events, and accidents. Often those influences come from outside of photojournalism itself. Uh, it adapts them as its own. Those influences might be telegraphy, which is uh, the telegraph uh, back in the day, chemistry back in the day, cinema, surrealism back in the day. All of those influenced uh, photography in its uh, infancy uh, and as it grew toward uh, maturity and as photojournalism grew as a kind of subgenre of photography in general. Uh, the history of photojournalism is a history of cameras, film, lighting equipment, uh, all developing at their own speed, as well as innovations in printing methods and the timely distribution of photos at great distances. And uh, this is the subtext of that paragraph is, uh, this is part of the world that photojournalists live in is this much broader world than oneself. One indeed is part of a machine. The machine has history and the machine has several talons. The machine is fed, okay, you ready for this one? This will freak you out. The machine is fed at several orifices. <laughs> okay, so it's a it's a big machine. It's a big thing. There there's a lot of um, uh, uh, give and take, warp and woof in this machine, and and that uh, that is a subtext to this whole issue of uh, it's many histories at once. It is a history of optics and cameras, which are themselves a history of clock making. A film, which is a history of chemistry, lighting equipment, which is in a sense a history of munitions and electricity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a lot of different histories dovetailing and kind of eating one another as they go. Let's start with the camera. Uh, for our purposes, photojournalists uh, will um, we'll begin with Kodak folding pocket cameras. Um, this was an innovation in the late 1800s, 1898 or so, shortly before uh, the innovation of the Brownie camera. Uh, these folding pocket cameras were for grown up photographers. Brownies were for everybody else. Um, here's another one. Later on, you'll see a photograph of, um, of uh, uh, Dorothea Lang 35 years later using one of these in the field. Um, you will notice as we go through this part of the presentation, the cameras and the film, uh, that Kodak keeps coming up and up and up and up and up. Um, Kodak was innovating at a breakneck pace, uh, perhaps not the pace at which Apple has been innovating the last 30 years, but kind of that. Um, and especially considering the speed at which lives unfolded, the speed at which time unfolded in the 19th century, uh, Kodak was um, constantly rushing forward, constantly pushing forward uh, new products, new films, new technologies every other year. Uh, it's kind of remarkable to chart how fast Kodak went from, well, from wet plates wet plates that one would sensitize in the field uh, during the Civil War. Matthew Brady, whom we won't talk about, uh, sorry to say, uh, Matthew Brady at, during the Civil War was sensitizing wet plates in a wagon uh, by the side of the battleground. Uh, and 30 years later, uh, people were running around with little cameras uh, using film in a roll. Um, the technology leapt forward um, by great leaps. And, and part of this, uh, we should always understand, is not simply Kodak as a monolith. Uh, Kodak becomes sufficiently wealthy that George Eastman and that company 
can buy up anything that moves them. It's like Google these days buying uh, uh, media startups. Um, if you have a groovy Snapchat idea and you can make it sing for a couple, three years, uh, assuredly Google will buy you for $2 billion. Um, that was in miniature how things happened during the era of uh, Kodak's ascendancy. Uh, Kodak became wealthier and wealthier, and they were able to gobble up all the little innovations that came down the road. So people, instead of maybe starting their own company, would sell their ID to Kodak, because why bother starting your own company? You'll just be crushed by the great yellow monster, right? So uh, Kodak um, becomes uh, uh, synonymous with a wide variety of innovation, not, not all of which came from under its roofs in uh, Rochester, New York. Uh, holding a Graflex camera, well, this is a perfect example, isn't it? Graflex was invented by two guys, names I don't remember, uh, who sold their idea to Kodak they became a division of Kodak. Uh, they became the blah, blah division responsible for producing Graflex and then later Speed Graphics, the big sturdy cameras. Their thing was the big sturdy cameras that the professionals would use, not the, um, uh, the pocket cameras that could be used by a variety of folks, uh, in including women, right? So, but these big old monsters and the Speed Graphics that came after were uh, from that Kodak division, which had innovated them in the first place. Uh, and here is uh, our old friend, Jacob Reese, uh, holding one of those cameras. It was an SLR camera. Uh, most of the rest for the next 80 years were not SLRs. We don't see the SLR come back into popular photography until the mid late fifties uh, with the, the various Japanese and German cameras like uh, the Zeiss Icon and then the uh, Canon, and then the Nikon. Uh, but this, this big wooden box is actually an SLR camera, which means that uh, you look through the, the box, uh, your vision bouncing off a mirror and through the lens so that whatever the lens sees, you see exactly that thing. You're not looking past anything with a viewfinder. Uh, you're not uh, um, uh, trying to overcome parallax, uh, which is when your view and the lens's view are not quite synchronous, right? That happens all the time. Think of a, a child's rainfinder camera. Uh, you're looking through here and the lens is down here. Um, the closer you get, the more they, they are not synchronous and that's parallax. Um, that's a parallax distortion is what that's called with an SLR camera, which is what most of you all are familiar with. Um, you look straight through the lens and you know exactly what you're seeing. And this camera, 70 years before its time, shall we say, um, uh, was a workhorse for, uh, for artists and for some journalists, uh, people like Jacob Reese. So let's take this opportunity to look at the work of Jacob Reese, uh, who was an educator and then a reformer. Uh, his interest was in children and their labor, immigrants and children and their labor, their working conditions uh, and the way they were used and abused by the powers that be, which is to say uh, landlords, corporations and uh, uh, the people would hire them, the people who'd hire them for pennies, um, pennies a week and put them to work. So here are a variety of photographs made by Jacob Reese. This is the famous Bandit's Roost. He um, photographed tenements in New York City and workplaces where uh, children uh, uh, spent 10, 12 hours a day. And his goal was not to make art, although um, in the years since we've begun to see this uh, uh, through an artistic lens. Uh, so we, we have revisioned these pictures um, as kind of art artifacts, uh, but for him, they were pure documents and his goal was simply uh, change, social change, period. Funny how he did such uh, spectacular work um, uh, without a care 
so he said, uh, to uh, the quality of the work. It was simply as a document that he made these pictures. Uh, so this was in the uh, late 1800s and the 1910s into the um, up toward uh, 1920. Here's that speed graphics, which became the journalist's tool. Um, it's the kind of brother of that Graflex that uh, we saw um, Reese holding. Uh, let's look at um, a couple other cameras. Here's, uh, here is um, a camera that, well, actually this changed everything. Why? Because it was so very, very usable uh, by journalists. It was a sheet filled film camera, <coughs> often, excuse me, uh, four by five. So uh, negatives that were about like so, uh, slipped into, I'll use my cell phone here, uh, slipped into a holder. Imagine slipping a sheet into a holder and then covering it turning around, slipping another sheet in, covering that. So here with one body, two covers and two sheets of film, I have two shots. So I slide this into my camera, take the cover off, shoot a picture, cover back in, take it out, flip it around, in it goes again, cover off, shoot another picture. I've got two shots here. And for those people in that slower time, uh, two shots was a lot of shots. Uh, you could do an entire uh, newspaper assignment with two shots. In fact, for most people, it was a single shot and then another for insurance. You just shoot the same shot again, perhaps a half stop over or underexposed, whatever, right? So uh, this is a workhorse camera. You could sit on it, stand on it. People did that all the time. You could bang it into stuff. Um, this was, uh, uh, um, uh, you could pound nails with this. Uh, not so this, which is the camera perhaps that uh, changed everything uh, for many of us. Uh, I would say for all of us, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, this is Oscar Barnack's Leica, uh, created in the mid-20s. Um, 1924, I think, is when he began serious work on this camera. Um, Barnack was a, a, an employee of the lights company, L-E-I-T-Z. Uh, you might be aware of the lights lenses. Uh, those cameras used lights lenses, but the camera itself was Barnack's design, kind of a hobby he did in his spare time. Uh, and uh, so he developed this camera from about 1924 till 1927 or 28, um, put it on the market then and put it on the market um, in a big way with the big splash the hard opening in about 1932, uh, when it uh, when one of the early models was purchased by uh, Cartier-Bresson, the aforementioned. Um, here are a couple different Leicas with their lights lenses, and the issue was they are small cameras, handheld, light, rather than these two frames. They carry a roll that has 36 frames. 36 frames of what was at the time movie film. Uh, a little later on, Kodak began uh, developing and marketing film that was cut to the exact proportions of these cameras, uh, specifically for these cameras. Uh, but in the moment, um, it was movie film that people loaded into these cameras. Uh, and you could uh, get 36 exposures per roll, a light handheld camera, with a really fast lens, fast for those times. Uh, it was a whole different way of making pictures. And earlier I said, um, change things for everybody, no matter the kind of camera you use. And it changed things for everybody because it allowed um, smart artistic people to make whatever pictures they desired to make. And the rest of us learned as a result, I'm thinking specifically of Cartier-Bresson, uh, of course, there was many, many others. Cartier-Bresson's eye uh, uh, revolutionized the way people saw photographs. So whether you ever went near one of these cameras or not, uh, Cartier's Cartier-Bresson's eye influenced others, and they influenced others, and those pictures were in magazines and newspapers and advertisements, etc. And uh, the whole world began to see. Uh, more like Cartier-Bresson saw. Uh, 
grandpa um, because um, his gift his gift was so huge he just influenced a generation and people thereafter saw the way he did. Here's a more modern, believe it or not, uh, Leica. This is an M2, I think. Uh, and the camera is not gold. It's brass underneath. And uh, it was well known among uh, Leica users that uh, those who had used the hell out of their cameras could uh, expect them to brass, quote unquote. Uh, in other words, the enamel and the paint would wear off and uh, you would have this brassing. It's like Willie Nelson's guitar. It tells everybody that you've been around and put a lot of mileage on that thing. Uh, here's uh, Mr. Cartier-Bresson himself as a very young man using his Leica. Um, he bought his in about 1932 or 33, uh, the son of wealth. Um, there's no getting around that. He was, uh, he was a rich guy's kid who was able to buy stuff and then travel. Um, however, he made the best of, of those opportunities and he traveled widely and uh, recreated how we saw photographs. Here are just a few of um, his kind of signature photographs. Um, he had, uh, he was uh, a a cafe kid in Paris in the 20s, uh, hung around with artists and writers uh, of that era. And so uh, was a great uh, fan of and, and hoped to be a practitioner of surrealism and Dada. In fact, uh, uh, until the end, he said, I'm not a photographer, I'm a surrealist. I think of, of him more as a Dadaist, uh, not to parse words. Um, but he, he surely found unnatural juxtapositions of unlike objects in the real world and uh, made photographs of those. Um, these photographs, which he made uh, in his first years of using the Leica, uh, became the foundation for much, much that followed. These pictures are made in, uh, uh, in Cuba, in Spain and in Mexico in the mid thirties. Perfect example of um, kind of the, the surrealist uh, um, urge. Um, we see all these forms and lines that dominate the picture. At a certain point, uh, we believe we know who the subjects of the picture are. There are these ladies with their bread. Surely they are the subjects, but the picture itself is about those lines. Um, if one squints and allows the uh, photograph to flatten, um, one sees uh, a uh, uh, a Cy Twombly drawing, um, uh, an abstraction with all those lines, uh, the picture is about itself as much as it's about those women. And that is surely a very modernist thing to say about a photograph. Uh, Cartier-Bresson did that all the time. That was the thing he did um, until after the war. Uh, when, as I'll show you, uh, he began doing photojournalism. Uh, but, uh, but these pictures are the basis of his photojournalism and much of the photojournalism that came um, from other people. Uh, those small cameras, which were rangefinder cameras, which is to say you looked through a hole in the camera, you didn't see exactly what the lens saw. Uh, the lens saw straight ahead and you saw uh, above it a little to the right. Um, those cameras were uh, not replaced, but enhanced for sure uh, by these cameras in the mid and late 50s. Based on some German designs, these Japanese cameras took over the market. They are SLR cameras, it's very similar to what you all probably own, the DSLRs that you probably own. Um, there's, uh, if you can imagine, a mirror uh, at a 45 degree angle right under that F 
on the Nikon F so that whatever goes into the lens strikes that 45 degree mirror and bounces up to another mirror that bounces that sight uh, into uh, your, um, in, into the photographer's eye. So in other words, the photographer can see exactly what the lens sees. That's the whole point of these cameras. They're bigger and clunkier because they've got all these damn mirrors inside them. Uh, they're not as light for that reason. And they jump a little bit when you click the button, right? Because you've got these two mirrors that have to fly up out of the way in order to expose the film. And then they come clattering back into place after the film has been exposed. So they're heavier cameras because of all the machinery and they jump and pop. And so they're different than the Leica. The Leica is quiet. Uh, you can chick, chick, chick. No one knows you're there. It doesn't bounce or move. It's, it's almost like just winking an eye, right? Whereas these cameras are like kapow, ching, kapow, ching, right? Uh, but people learn to use them, and there are great reasons and benefits to use these cameras. They become the cameras that photojournalists use, uh, especially um, in Vietnam in the mid-60s and afterwards. Uh, they kind of take over the, uh, the marketplace. Um, these uh, strong, heavy Nikon and Canon cameras. Um, these are the kinds of cameras used by uh, the great Leticia Battaglia, uh, a Sicilian, a Sicilian writer and reporter uh, who decided to make photographs to accompany her uh, newspaper articles uh, in the late 70s. So she taught herself to be a photographer uh, at her paper in Palermo, Sicily, uh, where had begun um, the Mafia Wars of the 80s. So Leticia Battaglia stumbled into uh, her life's work, which was photographing these horrific mafia wars in the streets of Palermo for her newspaper uh, for about 15 years. It was apparently a bloodbath every day, like the godfather on steroids. And she was the lady from the local paper who had uh, no problem with kind of walking up, waving to the cops, showing her badge and making wide angle pictures of, um, of uh, the de dear departed. So uh, we've talked about cameras and their history and some of the people who use them. Let's talk about a parallel history, which is the film. So for our purposes, uh, film begins with the dry plate. Um, as I say, we had used wet plates um, uh, that were uh, uh, coated with emulsion. An emulsion is the liquid light sensitive goo that you place onto a sturdy and stable uh, uh, um, strata, substrata. So you place it onto glass or you place it onto celluloid, clear celluloid. Uh, and once it dries, then you can make some photographs. Um, you do that in the field. Um, but Kodak, uh, again, their boundless rush forward with innovation uh, brings out the dry plate, uh, dry plate film in about 19, or, uh, 1888. Here are some, here's some glass plate negatives, just so you have a sense of them. Imagine a piece of glass about as big as a paperback book uh, with this emulsion and then a, a photographic negative on it. Here you can see someone holding one of these. This is one of the plates from the, um, uh, uh, from that folding camera, uh, they were about two and a quarter by three and a quarter inches. So in this case, um, uh, think of a pack of cigarettes, about as big as a pack, a fat pack of cigarettes, right? Uh, so Kodak created the dry plate, which changed everything. And then 10 years later, they created uh, actual film itself, which, which uh, uh, jettisons the glass, and instead uses 
celluloid. And that's the material that we are familiar with today. Uh, it's a uh, uh, clear plastic, however many inches wide. I believe these are two and a half inches wide and it fits into a camera where you can uh, shoot and then reel it forward, shoot and reel it forward so that uh, you begin with a kind of a virgin roll and you end with a roll that has been shot at um, you know, 12 or 15, 20 times, and then you process it. Uh, so what an amazing innovation. Uh, first to go from the wet to this, and then to go from glass to these things in rolls, spectacular innovation. It, it must have changed everything for everybody every seven years. Let's leap forward to the next film innovation, and that's Kodachrome. It's a color film that was developed during the 30s and marketed uh, in about 1942, just in time for the Second World War. We, we do have uh, some uh, photographs of, uh, for example, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin um, meeting um, uh, on Kodachrome. Uh, so Kodachrome was a particular kind of color transparency that had to be processed by very special machinery of which there were uh, a few such machines in the country. So you always had to send it out. Send it out and it'll come back in a couple weeks. Transparencies were the coin of the realm for magazines. If you were gonna shoot color for magazines, uh, you did uh, that with these transparency films. Just to give you a sense of what Kodachrome looked like. And the reason I say that is because uh, people talk about Kodachrome all the time. Uh, photographers uh, reminisce about it lovingly. Of course, everybody remembers the Paul Simon song. I believe there was a, a movie from a couple of years ago uh, called Kodachrome about a photographer who may have been shooting his last role. Um, there are, uh, 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 when you go to your Barnes and Noble or wherever, um, in the photography bookshelves there at the Barnes and Noble, uh, there are three or four books waiting for you that uh, lovingly remember Kodachrome. So Kodachrome is a cultural thing. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like baseball or, uh, you know, certain kinds of cars. It is well remembered, uh, it's a cultural touchstone, um, but it was the real thing, it, the real, real, real thing. Uh, I think you can see there's just that density of information and uh, beautiful blacks, beautiful whites, uh, great saturation. Look at those blues, the yellow, the reds. Uh, that's just a piece of film and it's pretty special. Uh, to give you another couple examples of what Kodachrome looked like, here's that famous uh, Steve McCurry photograph of uh, Satagora, um, the young woman who uh, became famous for this, uh, the most reproduced photograph uh, in history. Uh, in just a few short years later, I, I think in 48, 49, I think it's 49, there it is, um, uh, Code of Color was released. And Code of Color is another leap forward. It's not a uh, transparency film used by professionals that would take weeks to process at a location far, far away. This is something that you could do if push comes to shove. Uh, in your own darkroom, surely uh, the chemist at the corner, the pharmacist could do that for you as well. And they could strike prints from it. Um, there was never a satisfactory way for regular folks to print out um, the uh, color transparencies of Kodachrome and other, other transparency films. Kodacolor, you could strike prints and everybody wants to have prints. You can see that the film is a little bluer. It feels a little thinner. Uh, it's not as dense or saturated. Uh, surely a good printer can, can manage some of that, but the film itself was simply not as richly endowed as Kodachrome, but it was extremely usable for regular people who wanted to have uh, prints to keep for their albums. Finally, uh, probably the greatest kind of film innovation of the 20th century, that's my opinion, is uh, the Tri-X film. Tri-X is yet another black and white film, no difference there, but the ASA, or for those of you familiar with uh, 
more familiar with digital cameras, the ISO, the sensitivity of that film is 400, 400 ASA or ISO. Um, incredible, uh, considering that heretofore, uh, the average sensitivity was 25 or 40. Um, Kodachrome was 64. Tri-X is uh, uh, 400 and can be easily pushed to 800 or more, which means that photographers with those small cameras, remember those light small cameras, you can jump around, you can run and gun, you can hand hold them, no tripod, you've got fast lenses that you can interchange with other lenses. Now those cameras can be equipped with this very high speed, very sensitive film. Uh, it seems like for users of those cameras, suddenly the sky is the limit. Anything can be photographed. <coughs> Let's show a couple of photographers using both Kodachrome and uh, a Tri-X. Actually, I think only Gordon Parks, shown here, is using both. And then uh, Philip Griffiths is just using Tri-X. But it's, it's a, those are both beautiful films. So let's, let's look at photographers who are using them. Um, Parks uh, uh, from St. Louis, Missouri, a, uh, a polymath and a Renaissance man. Uh, he was a known musician. A, a, a writer, a photographer who worked 30 years for Life magazine, uh, and then a filmmaker. And uh, among his films was Shaft. He uh, was the director of, of Shaft in 1972. He himself was in his mid 60s at the time, uh, but uh, a, an erudite, energetic, and very handsome dude who, um, who uh, did great work, especially in the photo realm for Life Magazine and others. So here is him using um, uh, Tri-X, beautiful film, beautiful tonalities. The tonalities in the grays are uh, especially special. Look out for those. This is a bad reproduction, sorry to say, uh, of another uh, photograph by Gordon Parks. Um, he was associated with Malcolm X he did lots and lots and lots of work in Harlem um, for Life Magazine and others. Uh, he was boots on the ground uh, and uh, a, a great pro doing really difficult work. I mean, for example, this Kodachrome photograph that he made in a prison is um, hard as hell to have made. Uh, this is from a, a photo essay that he did for Life Magazine in the early 60s, which is just been released as a book, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and all of the pictures, I would have to say almost two to one, they are feats of technical bravado, uh, just in the sense that they're devilishly hard to make. In those days, with those materials, those cameras and lenses, and especially uh, that Kodachrome film, uh, you could make uh, beautiful tones, but you uh, were hard pressed, uh, to say the least, to expose the film. Um, his exposures are spectacular and uh, in a way kind of impossible. He was uh, a heck of a technician. So this is his crime story. Uh, I believe it's called something like the environment of crime. It's not that, but it's, it, it's, it's not as clunky as that, but it almost is. It's, uh, you know, the era of crime, the vibe of crime, the something of crime. Uh, but it's this uh, really bravado performance published as a book 60 years later. As you can imagine, he was also for uh, Life Magazine, their race man, so-called. Um, and uh, he often photographed in the American South. Um, indeed, he photographed in South America. Uh, he, he was all over the place, um, but photographing under difficult circumstances, um, people having difficult lives. So here he's documenting um, some of the some of Jim Crow um, manifest in civic architecture and such. So another uh, Tri-X shooter, uh, the great, the great and grumpy. Uh, Philip Jones Griffith, a, uh, a Welshman 
who worked for AP and then uh, Magnum Photos. He was Magnum's kind of man on the ground in Vietnam uh, throughout the 60s. And, and we would be remiss not to mention Vietnam. It was, uh, it was that war that put uh, television coverage and um, uh, magazine photographic coverage um, in the forefront. Um, that's where we learned the power of television and of still photographs to affect hearts and minds. Um, Griffith and others photographing and transmitting photographs from uh, Vietnam every day for years and years. Turn the tide. So we've talked about cameras, lenses. Now we'll talk about flash. Flash is a way to add light to a scene when you need that in order to make an uh, adequate exposure. Um, in the beginning, flashes were created uh, in the most primitive and most obvious of ways. I mean, how would Wiley e. Coyote uh, um, make a flash? He would get some Acme uh, gunpowder and uh, light it in, and light it up. And that's how Wiley e. Coyote would do it. And that's how these dudes do it, did it, as a matter of fact. Um, imagine a handle like this guy's got and a little tray, uh, uh, um, maybe 18 inches, maybe 12 inches, like a trough, like something that a, a, a mason would have. Um, and you spread your uh, thing in a trough, just like putting um, uh, um, tobacco into rolling paper, right? Uh, that's where your basically your gunpowder goes. Uh, and then you light the sucker up. Uh, up until about 1902, that's what you did. Uh, you might have an assistant do it. As you can imagine, that's a spectacularly dangerous thing to do. It's also very inconvenient for everybody else who hasn't yet shot off their own because once you explode that thing to make this brilliant magnesium flash, uh, the room is filled with smoke uh, and no one else can make a photograph, not you nor anyone else. Uh, for the next several minutes while everybody waits for the smoke to clear so that somebody else can make a photograph that will uh, flip everyone out. So, so it's a blitzkrieg for sure. It's a spectacular invasion of everything for sure. And it gets better though, because uh, in 1902, I think, uh, electricity is introduced. So you no longer have to have an assistant with a live match lighten that damn thing. In fact, what they did is they wore a, they had a leather cuff they would wear, a both this guy here, right, holding on to it, and the assistant, they would have a leather cuff because you've got to put a live match on that, right? So as of 1902, there was an electronic, imagine uh, the handle of a baseball bat filled with batteries, right? Like nine, 12, 17 batteries, and then a cord, and it has an igniter. In a way, it's just like your uh, barbecue. You would, uh, it's, but it's the same ultimate result is that you've got this damn flash powder in your little trough, uh, at, but you light it electronically. So there's less of a chance that you're gonna kill your assistant. Everything else remains the same, right? Um, that stays stable, that situation stays stable until the early 20s when um, uh, bulbs, flash bulbs are invented. Now, this is not a picture of a flash bulb. This is the next step. So flash bulbs, which some of you remember from your earlier days, uh, I surely do. My mom and dad used flash bulbs in our Instamatic. Um, flash bulbs were an innovation that changed all that. So isn't that great? Uh, looking backwards from that innovation, we know that they're a hassle, hassle and a half. Uh, you got to rip them out of the camera. They're hot to the touch. Uh, you got to find somewhere to put them and then you put another one in so that you can make another picture. So again, looking backwards, it's a hell of an inconvenience. Although at the time, they must have thought that was a miracle. Flash bulbs rather than, you know, basically a magnesium explosion. Uh, but better yet, 
um, uh, by uh, the mid 40s, a guy named Bob Farber, that's him, at the Milwaukee Journal, um, started learning how to create strobes that are similar to the strobes you all have for your DSLRs now. In other words, it's an electronic, uh, it's a fully contained electronic unit that creates a, a huge blast of light fast. Um, our strobes now are about a thousandth of a second. Um, he was experimenting with much faster strobes. Why? Because he learned his craft from Dr. Harold Edgerton at MIT. Edgerton made, and I'm sorry to say I don't have any of those pictures here, just an oversight. Uh, Edgerton made those great photographs of the drop of milk poof, uh, exploding and rippling into, uh, in, well, in, into milk. Um, uh, just a drop choo, and poof, it explodes, right? Just, just a, a ripple and a little explosion. It's, it's the small gesture of, 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 of everyday nature, but Edgerton was able to strobe so fast and so hard with such a kind of fast lens that he was able to see things, see it, catch it. And he catched that little splash and he catched the little ball. Uh, he did the same thing with uh, a bullet fired through an apple. He caught the bullet going through the apple and coming out, right? With a splash of light and a fast shutter. Uh, he did the same thing with a playing card, believe it or not. He put a playing card up and shot through it laterally and there are some spectacular photographs of this playing card, two halves of the playing card, and the bullet flying in between them. Spectacular. But what that requires is a super fast, super bright flash of light. So Dr. Harold Edgerton at MIT was able to create that. Uh, he was very generous with his secrets. Uh, he passed them on to uh, one guy named Guillaume Milly. Uh, a Swiss photographer who worked for Life magazine, Mealy used uh, Edgerton's techniques on the cover of, of uh, uh, Life magazine to photograph actors dancing and Picasso painting. Uh, he also uh, uh, shared his secrets with this guy here, Bob Farber of the Milwaukee Journal, a photographer at that newspaper who uh, spent several years uh, on his own as a hobby after hours creating a strobe that could be used by a regular person. Um, uh, his first strobe that he finally developed it and, and took into the field uh, weighed 25 pounds. The battery weighed 25 pounds. Uh, a couple of years later, he got it down to 12 pounds and then he started marketing it. And so now today we all have these strobes that we buy for hundred bucks. They go on top of our cameras. Uh, they weigh a half a pound. Um, and they put out a nice, uh, brilliant burst of light at about a thousandth of a second, and you can stop action and you can illuminate a dark scene. Here's someone, the great and famous Ouija, also known as Arthur Felig, um, using a flash bulb in a reflective pan on his speed graphic. Uh, Ouija worked uh, the night. I think that's how the copywriters would say it. Ouija worked the night. Uh, in New York City through the 30s and 40s, uh, he came to LA after a while and worked the night in LA. Um, what, whatever you have in your imagination about the sleazy, uh, uh, fast on his feet, opportunistic photo shark. Uh, leaping out of taxi cabs and, and, and racing to photograph um, an actress with her knickers down or a crime land murder or uh, whatever, you know, that guy with the cigar. Ouija is that guy and he was certainly that guy. He was no joke. He's the real guy. So here's a, a Harlem photograph. What, my all-time favorite Ouija picture, a Harlem photograph. He would go to everywhere. So if there was a murder, he went there at two o'clock in the morning, but he may have been at the opera before that for an opening or at a museum for an opening or uh, at a, some such place for a whatever. He, um, he had a radio in his car, an early radio scanner, police scanner, and he just drove around and he uh, bumped up onto the curb and he leapt out and he photographed whatever was there. So in this case, it's uh, 
some kind of social event in Harlem. Uh, here are uh, children sleeping in a stairwell, all with that strobe. Here's a gangland murder. Again, all, all with that strobe. A couple guys in the paddy wagon. This is his famous picture. I'd be remiss to talk about Ouija and not show this picture. Um, the print is a little weird. I don't know if you can tell. This is a, on the far right, a kind of a, a scruffy down and outer who is either hectoring or simply hanging out near some society ladies um, and creating a photograph, which is obviously um, a contrast and uh, a certain comment about uh, uh, income inequality, especially in that era, which was the 1930s in New York City, when those things were so obvious and glaring, right? Uh, however, it's now known to be a faked picture. Uh, in fact, Ouija was very proud of having faked this picture. Uh, still in all, it's one of his famousest pictures. One of my favorite of the Ouija pictures. I love it when he does people in groups. Finally, publication. So you do all this stuff with the camera, the film, the optics, uh, and the strobe. You've got to get it published. It's hard to publish photographs uh, on an offset press uh, in the early years, um, photographs were made and used by newspapers, but not in the way you might think. Um, up until about 1890, 95, um, photographs were almost always used as uh, 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 the inspiration or uh, the, the direct influence, a direct influence on engravings and drawings. Uh, and so, for example, um, Walt Whitman um, in the Illustrated American, uh, here is uh, an engraving from a photograph of Walt Whitman. Here is uh, in Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper, which was one of the first and most famous of the pictorial press, uh, the picture press, as John Sarkovsky called it, um, uh, based on a photograph, the building of the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. The Daily Graphic in New York City. Everything was in New York City or uh, in uh, London or Paris, uh, as you might imagine. Um, the Daily Graphic often, often used photographs, and you can kind of see them here in the uh, that south uh, east quadrant. There are three different photographs that have become drawings of uh, some kind of construction, a railway construction is what it looked like. And here's a kind of a comparison of, of, on the left, of course, the famous photograph of uh, Ulysses S. Grant, and on the right, uh, an etching made from that, suitable for publication. The first known photograph to have been published by a photo engraving process in a newspaper. And now the first halftone. Uh, most of you know or have a sense of what a halftone is. You've probably heard that verbiage. The halftone screen is laid over an existing photograph and uh, um, light sensitive uh, paper or film is pressed onto that. Um, and uh, by a reverse process, a halftone negative is made and then a halftone print that goes into the newspaper. Um, uh, 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 the halftone screen breaks all the solid and continuous tones up into little dots that are brighter, less bright. Um, in further innovations on the halftone screen, it's not simply dots that are darker or lighter, it's dots that are larger or smaller as they are darker and lighter. I think we'll see Here's Roy Lichtenstein. A pop art painting that suits our served purposes. Another Lichtenstein from the 60s. Um, but uh, 
If you didn't know what halftones were, now you know. That's how halftones work. And so when they finally became perfected uh, in the early 1900s, uh, there began the, area, uh, the era of the pictorial newspapers and magazines. It took about 20 years uh, between about 1885 and 1905, 1910 for halftones to become uh, uh, um, reliable enough and their use to be accepted enough um, uh, that they were used all the time in newspapers. Even though newspapers were able to use halftones, in 1890, 1895, uh, it was a very slow, like anything else that, that we experience in our own lives with technology, it comes on slow, comes on slow, you see it on the horizon, and then at a certain point, kabam, it goes fast. And suddenly we're racing downhill and we're all in. And so uh, by about 1910, newspapers and magazines were all in. This is the New York Times midweek pictorial um, which uh, was the most popular uh, part of the New York Times for many, many years. It was uh, chock full of pictures. Uh, again, the halftone process had developed to the point where you could actually do several pictures on one page. They would gang them in and create layouts with various sizes and dimensions of photographs uh, to kind of uh, serve a purpose. And thus began the march toward uh, the photo magazine that would do just this with uh, a, a, um, a, a great sweeping poetry in the way photos were used, cropped, um, sized, uh, and, and thus the birth of Life magazine. Life was one of Henry Luce's magazines in the teens and 20s. Luce uh, had created Time magazine and thereafter he created Fortune magazine, which we today think of as a business magazine. Um, but at the time it was, yes, sure it was business, but it was uh, photographs expressing um, uh, uh, um, the business spirit of the age. Uh, we remember that Americans were captivated by um, uh, how businesses and builders, engineers and monopolists were uh, building a new America. These uh, great plants, these factories, steam engines, skyscrapers. Um, and so Fortune Magazine was uh, full to the brim of those and it proved so successful that Luce was uh, tempted to make another uh, um, photographic picture magazine. He decided to revive life, uh, the moribund life magazine uh, that had been on his books uh, for all these years, dawdling in the rear. Uh, and he, he repackaged it, reintroduced it, uh, and it became this. This is the first issue of Life magazine um, with a photograph by uh, their staff photographer, one of four staff photographers at Life Magazine, who was a woman, uh, Margaret Bork White. And White was a great uh, photographer of um, uh, engineering and uh, modern life in the machine age. Also, it turns out she was a great portrayer of people and their dignity. Um, little did Luce know but she spent the next many years doing those kinds of projects for him as well. So this is the Peck Dam in, I think, Wyoming. Someone might correct me. Life Magazine became, it's, it's, it's hard to get this across. Life Magazine became the uh, uh, um, Yahoo News. It became, well, Yahoo Knows is, Actually, nothing at all, is it? Uh, it became the, um, the something something. It became the huge big ass thing in the culture for many, many years. Um, Americans who hadn't yet been habituated to radio, surely TV didn't exist. Um, Americans looked to life and to look and to pick and to scoop 
and to about a dozen other weekly magazines that were chock full of photographs to tell them about American life, whether it was the war, the economy, domestic issues, celebrities. Every week, there were a dozen of these picture magazines uh, that told Americans who they were. No small thing. This was the culture. This was the sweet spot and the high water mark in the culture, these magazines for about 20 years. Let's give you an example of a picture story um, uh, acquitted uh, by one of the masters in Life Magazine. So uh, again, imagine that there are 12 magazines like this every week, uh, not all as splendid as Life or Look were, um, but all good enough to convey uh, picture stories, uh, picture reportage about the culture. So 12 of those, 12 channels that would come into your mailbox every week with these picture stories about American subjects. So here is uh, the great, great uh, Eugene Smith um, doing arguably his most famous photo essay called Country Doctor. Smith photographed this, by the way, in Kremlin, Colorado, uh, in about 1950. Uh, as it happened, when I moved, when I personally moved from Detroit to San Francisco to begin my adult life in 1985, uh, I spent the evening with, a, with an old friend in Kremlin, Colorado. So that was, it was amazing to me to pull into Kremlin and go, holy shit, hold it. Is this freaking Kremlin? This is the place. So the country doctor, you see the various sizes and shapes of the pictures, the way they use um, uh, uh, headlines, uh, the tone of the thing, and all of these great photographs, each one a very special moment uh, from Gene Smith. He's photographing into a car in that one. He's got a down angle looking at a, a, a x-ray on the other, another down angle as the doctor uh, tapes up uh, a guy's ribs. Um, the boy, the, the look on that boy's face as he's getting whatever he's getting, a shot or a splinter. Uh, this is a busy doctor. Smith is with him every step of the way. This is a new thing in American culture and it ex is exactly what Americans want. Here's another from Gene Smith called The Nurse Midwife. Story of Maud Callan. It's Smith's favorite picture or uh, favorite story. And perhaps because there are so many spectacular individual pictures. I mean, this one on the left is so charming. Just the body language of that little girl. And again, on the bottom left, for me, that's, that's a thrilling picture considering how difficult it is to make those photographs in 1950. Let's stay with old Gene Smith for a minute because he is arguably the patron saint of um, modern photojournalism. You couldn't talk about pop music without talking about Lennon and McCartney. I would say uh, um, Cartier Bresson is our um, uh, McCartney perhaps. And uh, Gene Smith is definitely John Lennon. Uh, a troubled man, a difficult man, an angry man, um, but a, but probably the genius. If there was one, he's the genius. Um, he was injured during the Second World War. Uh, he made his name making photographs during the Second World War for Life magazine, where he had become a staff photographer. Um, although he quit in the middle of the war because he didn't think they were using his pictures right. Uh, that was uh, Smith's uh, great, great, great uh, integrity. And also uh, his Achilles heel was he was uh, a consummate believer in the value of his own work. And um, he, in fact, he quit Life Magazine twice over the years simply because he didn't agree with how they used his work. Um, he was a st stubborn old goat, uh, a man of great integrity as well. Um, but anyway, uh, Second World War, uh, he um, 
uh, just because he quit life doesn't mean he stops working. He, he was a well-known entity uh, and uh, well-beloved as a curmudgeon who could do miracles. So he worked for a variety of other uh, publications uh, ongoing in the Second War uh, until near the end when he was uh, injured uh, in the Pacific Theater um, by a mine uh, and spent two years uh, recovering. Um, uh, he didn't return to action until 1947. And the thing that urged him back to action was this photograph. Um, on one of the days when he could get up and get around, when he had the will and the spirit, the heart to pick up the camera, uh, which he felt had betrayed him. Um, on one of those days, he made this photograph of his children. Uh, uh, walking, quote unquote, to the Paradise Garden. He was one of those guys in that era who titled his pictures. That's what people did then. Um, and so this picture is called The Walk to the Paradise Garden. Those are his kids. And he said that when he made that picture and saw the negative, uh, he spent days printing it because he knew that his heart was in there and that that picture would draw him back into, uh, into life. And so thereafter, he was ready to rumble, and he began doing those um, famous photo essays for Life magazine, uh, another one of which was the Spanish Village, famous pictures in the Spanish Village, I mean, near biblical in their content and composition. He traveled widely, Welsh coal miners, so another, uh, 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 another way of, of getting at how obsessed he was, the perfectionist that he was, um, uh, much to his own de detriment, is he got a three-week assignment to do a, a photo essay about Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the um, steel town, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a three-week assignment that took him 10 years to do. Um, and this became his Dream Street uh, uh, essay, quote unquote. It became his obsession. Um, it was the windmill he tilted at for a decade. Uh, he became so obsessed with getting Pittsburgh right. Okay, we talked about cameras, lenses, and film. So we're creating the photograph. We're publishing it by way of half tones in picture packages often. Finally, the distribution of pictures. We'll spend just a minute on that, and then we're going to leap into the last part of this presentation, which is to show you some contemporary uh, photojournalists. So just a second for distribution. Uh, one of the wonders of, uh, of um, photo technology is the, the, the ability to electronically distribute uh, pictures uh, by uh, telegraphy, by telegraph um, processes and telephone. Uh, the AP figured this, actually several people figured this out in the 20s and the 30s. The AP put a button on it in the 30s uh, with, with uh, their collaboration with AT&T to build the AP wire photo system. And the AP being the Associated Press, they're one of the many agencies that collects and distributes news photographs. Uh, many of you these days are familiar with Getty or Corbis. Um, uh, the AP and UPI, Reuters and others uh, are, are similar in spirit, um, but they do news photographs. And so getting stuff out now, getting stuff now, getting it done, getting it finished, getting it ready and going is a big deal in the news business. So to be able to transmit, not by airplane or uh, horse and buggy or uh, an overnight steamer, but to be able to transmit electronically using telegraphy and then telephones mattered. And so uh, these, this whole system of the wire photo um, became huge in the 50s. Uh, here, for example, is what a wire photo looks like when it when it rolls out of this machine. 
and onto the editor's desk. It looks like this. Here are some photographs. Uh, I don't think there's a pruder photographs, it, probably too early. Uh, and a um, uh, uh, this long caption. That's how these pictures came. It was the picture and a caption below, a long typewritten caption. Uh, there might be one more, no. So that's how those pictures rolled out of the machines, ready to use by any local paper. So you could upload, so to speak, this photograph in New York, and within an hour or two, it would be in Iowa. It would be in uh, uh, New Mexico. It would be in Los Angeles, uh, where newspapers could use, for example, these photographs here. <coughs> OK. Let's finish this up at a sprint. Um, I promised you modern photojournalists, uh, but I realized that uh, we, 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 overlook, we didn't overlook. The structure of this thing um, wasn't convenient to uh, Dorothea Lang, but uh, one can never overlook Dorothea Lang. Uh, she, along with uh, Carty Brisson and Jean Smith are kind of the mid-century uh, pioneers and uh, guiding spirits. Um, so you see uh, old uh, um, Dorothea Lang uh, with her fold-out camera, her old-fashioned fold-out camera, um, working during the Depression. So uh, as, as everybody knows, the, uh, our uh, US and world economy crashed in 1929 and 30. Um, uh, uh, Roosevelt came into office in 1932, promising change. He and his administration had tons of great ideas, some of which they were able to get through easily. The rest needed lots of push. And in order to push through uh, various aspects of the New Deal, um, he needed to demonstrate uh, that things were actually really, really screwed up. Uh, I remember in those days when radio was in its infancy, and there was no television, there were no national newspapers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Life magazine didn't yet exist. Uh, in those days, it would be very possible for someone in New York City to not know that there was a Dust Bowl, not know that there were uh, migrants uh, enduring harsh circumstances in California in, in, the, uh, in the fields, uh, not know that the depression was in Chicago too. Um, very easy for uh, people and Congress people to not know these things. And so uh, Roosevelt uh, and his uh, information chief uh, needed to persuade Americans and congressional Americans that shit was bad uh, and that he had ideas. Uh, and so he, he uh, through the um, information department, the Farm Security Administration was born and headed by a guy named Roy Stryker, who hired photographers and writers, indeed poets as well, to go out into the fields, into the world outside of Washington and New York City, document it all, and send pictures back to Washington that he could use to sell his programs to Congress and that they could hand out to newspapers, these photographs, uh, in order to doubly uh, gain the support of the American public. So, but we needed a trove of pictures and we needed a certain kind of pictures. So Stryker, uh, the, the head of this uh, FSA, Farm Security Administration program, uh, created list, shooting lists, shooting lists. Uh, show me people of good faith working hard. Show me uh, people who are rattled by poverty, but their clothes are still clean. Show me people sleeping in ditches. Show me people sweating with the plow. Show me a, a country dance. Show me a barn dance. Show me a straw vote in a local constabulary. Show me all this Americana stuff. This was Roy Stryker's notion of how America worked. Turns out he was right. Uh, people like Dorothea Lang, the great Walker Evans, Ben Sean, Arthur Rothstein, a great many people who would become household names among photographers in the generation to come, got their start by going out there, carte blanche, to photograph in California, Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Missouri, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, right, um, on the government dime. 
And these were hardworking, uh, uh, very smart people, especially Walker Evans and Dorothea Lang, who uh, traveled with her partner, the sociologist and writer, Paul Taylor. <coughs> As with any aspiring young professional, everybody needs that one thing that captures the attention of the guys upstairs, that one thing that'll get you through the door. Um, Lang had made this photograph in Oakland, California, where she owned a portrait studio. Uh, she made this out the, out the window of a portrait studio. It was a bread line. Uh, and she showed it by hook or by crook to Stryker, who then hired her as one of his dozen staff photographers. And she went on the road, closed down the studio and went on the road to make pictures like this, uh, the famous migrant mother in Napomo, California, up just above the Bay Area. Pictures like this, spectacular pictures of uh, Okies on the road, fleeing the Dust Bowl. It is her example uh, that uh, moved a lot of um, documentary photographers forward. That's why she's represented here. Um, here's Manzanar uh, in the uh, California high desert. This is the internment camp where uh, Japanese from Los Angeles uh, were sent. We would be remiss not to mention Robert Kappa. I think I told you about him earlier. Uh, the famous Hungarian war photographer uh, working for Life magazine, who uh, uh, was a tremendous self-promoter, which is to say that most of what we know about him might be a sham. Still in all, he was a pretty good photographer. Um, uh, it is by coincidence that I show you two of uh, two pictures for which he is most famous, A and B, which have in recent years stirred lots of controversy. These are the pictures that might be somewhat faked or, uh, uh, or if not faked, uh, there's a, a whole bubble of misinformation that surrounds them over the years. Uh, this is a Spanish soldier in the Spanish Civil War, presumably at his moment of death. Uh, this is the picture about which Kappa said, uh, if the pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. And having shot this and said that, he became a saint of all uh, news photographers, photojournalists, and war correspondents. And of course, this is his famous D-Day picture. Kappa got together after the war in 1947 with uh, the famous Henri Cartier-Bresson, whose pictures with a Leica we saw earlier. He and uh, Bresson decided they wanted to, um, in the post-war era, they wanted to sell the shit out of their international pictures uh, to uh, magazines in New York and Paris. Uh, and so they needed an agency that would collect the pictures while they were in the field, collect the film, process the film, create prints, and sell them. So they needed uh, people who were congenial to editors and publishers who could do the dirty work while these dudes were out in the field. So they created a collective agency called Magnum, which uh, became the premier photo agency in the world. Magnum is shorthand for that group of photographers in the last 60, 70 years who are thought to be the greatest uh, of, of their generations on the planet. Um, and, and obviously that, that requires a willing suspension. But, uh, but anyway, they, 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 Magnum has an incredible track record and an incredible uh, history of, uh, of great, great photography. We'll show just a few of Cartier-Bresson's photojournalism style pictures. We showed some of his kind of surrealist everyday uh, flaneur style pictures. Uh, this is the journalism that he commenced in 1947. He went on the road for about 10 years 
uh, spent most of that time in India, uh, Pakistan, in Russia, um, Southeast Asia. This is the beginning of modern photojournalism. Okay, we'll end with a few of these. Here's Bruce Davidson, who uh, became a member of Magnum in the late 1950s as a very young man. He was handpicked by Cartier-Bresson himself. He did work for Life Magazine, which is how he gets to be in this group of people. He knew who his audience was. He had a job to do and he did it. He was assigned to go to Wales. He was assigned, uh, he wasn't assigned. He was not assigned to do this Brooklyn gang. Um, these people look kind of tame by today's uh, 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 standards. That looks like my nephew and his girlfriend. But at the time at Coney Island, these were the scary thugs that, um, uh, that uh, kept your grandparents up at night. This was the Brooklyn gang. See that guy with the tattoos? That was considered some scary ass shit at that time. These were the bad boys of Brooklyn at Coney Island. He spent a couple years with them. Worked in Harlem, shooting with large cameras and strobes. He was on the road uh, during the civil rights years. I think his is probably the greatest uh, uh, collection of civil rights era photographs. Here's his color essay from 1980 on the New York subways. Here's Eli Reed, another Magnum member. Reed worked extensively for Time and others in the 80s and 90s, uh, but he also did his own projects. His most recent book, of which this is the cover, is called something. <laughs> I don't remember. His first book was called Black and White America. Um, the second one, gosh, geez, just came out. I'm sorry to say, I forgot it. I, I knew it two hours ago. But um, clearly uh, he's concerned with the African-American community in, in, in the US as well as um, around the world. Here's St. James Knockway probably the greatest stylist uh, in photojournalism today, although he's, uh, he's getting long in the tooth. He's probably 75 now, but he does keep working. Uh, that was Gaza. Uh, this is 9-11 as the towers fell above the Trinity Church near Wall Street. He's a master of black and white. And for 30 years, he's been everywhere, you name it. Tiananmen, uh, uh, Rwanda. This is Rwanda. Afghanistan and Iraq. He's been injured several times in Afghanistan and Iraq while there for Life Magazine or for Time Magazine in recent years. There's St. Jim. Uh, this photograph was made by David Turnley. Now, when I was a young pup learning how to do photojournalism in Detroit, uh, I had the great good fortune of looking at David Turnley's photographs every day um, in the Detroit Free Press. He was a staff photographer there, uh, but soon he departed. He didn't leave the paper, but he left town. He got them, smart guy, 
he got them to send him to South Africa uh, to photograph the apartheid story uh, for two years, after which he moved to Paris and was an international correspondent for the free press and all of its brother and sister stories. So he became acquainted, of course, with Nakwe and everybody else. Uh, here's David Turnley on the left with his twin brother, Peter Turnley on the right, who's a contract photographer for Newsweek during that same period. So one would be photographing Gorbachev for the cover of Newsweek while the other is in Rwanda doing a thing. And then they would meet in China and work together for three weeks uh, and then part ways and then meet up again. Uh, David Turnley was especially known for his South African work. He was associated with uh, Nelson Mandela and became great friends with both him and uh, Winnie. Visited Mandela in prison, was there for the release, photographed in the shanty towns. Here is a uh, uh, desert storm, 1991. This is the picture he won his Pulitzer for. This is Tiananmen Square, 1989. Rwanda. This is funny. So here's David Turnley's photograph from the fall of the Berwin, Berlin Wall. Uh, if you've used color negative film, you will kind of be familiar with those tones, the tonal palette is clearly color negative film. So here's another picture made by a dude standing right next to him. Uh, and that's his brother, Peter Turnley. Here's Turnley's award-winning photograph from Tiananmen. Peter has, uh, now that he's off the road, um, he uh, lives in Paris and New York, poor guy and um, uh, sees himself, I say he sees himself, he demonstrates himself to be a kind of a throwback humanitarian photographer, a Cartier-Bresson style humanist photographer uh, in and around Paris and elsewhere. So the dignity, dignity of, of regular people, uh, love, uh, life, dancing and wine, the beauty of things, the innocence of others, etc. There they are together. Nathan, in I can't think of a better way to 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 end this up right now with with the humanity of of his work for sure. We are the humanity of the Turnleys will play us out. Over where okay, we cool. And uh, we didn't really have any questions in the chat, so that's totally. 100%, I wanna thank you for being here and I wanna thank all of y'all for being here and supporting the Los Angeles Center of Photography. And uh, we will see you next time.